Welcome to the services of the Double Spring Church of Christ on this Sunday morning. We're so glad that you're with us. I know this is a little bit different. We continue to streamline our services. I heard the other day where somebody said, well, they've canceled their services. We've not canceled our services. We hope that everyone is, is worshiping at their home, and we just pray that soon this inconvenience will pass. I know it's brought some changes. Uh, I was actually supposed to be in Atlanta, Georgia today, preaching in a gospel meeting at the Forest Park Church, uh, but that maybe will happen sometime later on this year. Those leading our service this morning, uh, Brother Randy Moody will be leading in the op uh, opening prayer. Uh, Brother Don Posey will be presiding at the Lord's table in a contribution. Brother Justin Good will bring our lesson, and Brother James Allen Pruitt will lead our dismissal prayer. I want to mention just a few that we continue to pray for in our sick list. Um, Brother Larry Nelson is in the hospital at St. Vincent in Birmingham. He was carried there in uh, an emergency situation on uh, Friday. He is much better as of last night, and we're thankful to report that. Uh, Brother Lee Hamby has had a couple of days, the last couple of days have been uh, not so good, and he will be going on Thursday of this week uh, back to Florence. Brother Kenneth Whittemore continues to do quite well, and for that we're thankful. Uh, Miss Ann Pearl, Sister Pearl, will be going on Tuesday of this week to have a nuclear test at Princeton, and uh, we hope that they will schedule her uh, ablation surgery soon afterward. We continue to remember Mr. Etzel Martin. Uh, he is awaiting surgery, too, at Princeton. We have two of our men that are suffering with the shingles, uh, Roger Moody and Eddie Dinsmore, and uh, we're thankful that they are doing some better. Please continue to remember Sister Shelby Edwards, uh, Brother Steve Freeman, uh, Tammy Harbin, and Becca both tested negative uh, for the coronavirus, and we're so thankful for that. Tammy does have her power back on after the tornado that hit Carbon Hill. Will Mathis continues to have rehab, and he has been cleared to go back light duty to work now. Uh, little Juliet uh, Posey continues to do well, and for that we are very, very thankful. Uh, let's worship God now together in song. And then after three songs, we'll be led in prayer. Thank you for being with us today.
Springs, Alabama. We're thankful, God, that you love us enough and have blessed us enough, God, that we realize that not a single thing that you've promised has ever failed. And we just realize, God, that sometimes we have troubles and trials and temptations, but you're right there with us. And for that, we're so thankful, God. We just ask God, if you would, to help us to count our blessings and realize that through these tough times and the 
blessings that we receive from it. We know, God, that families are brought closer and that we realize that maybe there's some things that were not so important in life that we can slow down a little bit and realize, stop and smell the roses, so to speak, and just count our blessings and realize, God, that you've given us so much. And God, we're mindful of those that are suffering from the coronavirus and other illnesses. And we just ask if you would to be with our health care people that are working so abundantly with them and give them through your providence, God, the things they need to help these people. And God, we're especially mindful of the the ones that are in the nursing homes. And we ask God, if you would, to be with us in the United States that we might realize that, you know, the nursing homes haven't always been, that the people have been taken care of in their homes. We're especially mindful of someone like Tim Mulliken is his wife, Kathy, they've gone through so much to keep him at home, help us to, God, to do the things we need to do to care, love, and care for one another, and to help each other, God, to maybe not go to those nursing homes, but we're mindful, God, that of the people that are there that are suffering from the illnesses and the deaths that's been going on. We ask if you would to bless the ones that the caretakers there. We're mindful, God, of those that serve as our first responders that, that are out on the roads and going to these homes that never know what they're going to find. And we just ask, if you would, to be with them and they'll be able to go through this time and without any troubles or trials. And we ask, God, if you would, to be with our law enforcement people as they're out about and doing the things they need to do to make sure that the country stays safe and we just ask if you would to bless them and God we just ask if you would to be with all of those that are working at this time even the the ones that work in the the places where that are essential and the ones that clean the floors and the ones that do the the essential things that need to be done bless each one God help us all God to stop and count our blessings and realize that we live in the most abundant country in the United States or in the world and help us, God, that we might use the blessings you bless us with to help others and to be able to work with our leaders from Washington to the state to our county and our local governments to get this thing over with and bring back our economy and help the things that to grow that need to grow. But God, help us to Make sure it's done in a way that would be help, healthy and safe. God, we're thankful for your church. We're to be a part of that church that you offer us to, a way to become in, to get into Christ. We're thankful for our four good elders that lead us here, for Jim and Frank and John Larry and Don as they lead us as elders. And we know, God, that they've, they've stepped up at a time that uh, there was things that had to be done and they've done those things and we're continuing to work to spread the gospel and for that we're thankful. We're thankful for our preachers that preach and teach and we ask God if you would to bless them. And we're thankful for our men that serve as deacons. God, please bless each of them. God, we're mindful of our young people. We know that the schools have been canceled. There will be seniors that won't be graduating but we're just thankful, God, that we have people in the education field that have stepped up and provided the things that they need to get their lessons done and to at least get the most important stuff done. And we're thankful that they have done that on their own, God, and just got things going. And we realize that in this country that people get things done. We don't sit back and wait for others to do it, but we, we, we take pick up the pick it up and run with it. We don't don't wait for someone else to do it. We ask God, if you would, to bless those that have been mentioned this morning that are sick and hurting. We know, God, that during these times we're all while we're on this earth, we're going to have sickness and death. And we just ask, if you would, to be with those that are sick and hurting, that through your providence things can be done to return them to better portions of their health. And we just ask God, if you would, to be with those that are grieving over the loss of loved ones and comfort them. God, we're thankful that you've 
allowed us to enjoy the rain. We look around, we see the birds, the flowers, and the many things that you provided for us. And we realize, God, that, you know, as long as we're here, that things will go on and that you're in charge. And help us always, God, to realize that we'll put you first and others second and ourselves last, that you will care for us. We ask God, if you would, to be with Justin this morning as he brings us a lesson that will take it and apply it in our lives to make us better Christians, better servants in your kingdom. God, we're mindful of our country once more, of the men and women that serve our country, of the families of those that have given their lives in service to this country. We just ask, if you would, to continue with us, God. Help us count our blessings and to rely on you and get through these things. We ask, if you would, to watch over us and care for us. Please forgive us of our sins as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. chapter 12 verse 2 we are told that Jesus endured the cross despising the shame you know it's nearly impossible for anyone living in our time and especially in our country today to fully appreciate the dreadful meaning of those words the cross we certainly can understand to a degree the great pain and suffering that accompanied crucifixion but we have no way of understanding the great shame and disgrace that was associated with this form of capital punishment. You know, today when we think of a cross, we think of a sacred emblem that's revered and honored. It's an emblem that we speak of when we sing our songs. It's an ornament that we fashion out of precious metals like gold or silver, and we hang about our necks that symbolizes all that's good 
and beautiful in the world. It's a symbol that stands in a place of honor on top many of our places of worship. With this view in mind, it cannot be surprising to us that we fail to appreciate the shame and the disgrace of the cross. You know, in the days when Jesus was crucified, the cross symbolized something very different than it does today. It symbolized all of the treacherous, brutal crimes for which it was the ultimate penalty. It stood as a degrading, humiliating, and shameful death. In the gospel account of the crucifixion, we read that Jesus was mocked, he was derided, he was reviled, he was spat upon, and he was stripped of his clothing before he was crucified. You see, the goal of Roman crucifixion wasn't just to execute the criminal. The goal was to shame, disgrace, and humiliate the victim in a very public way. Jesus didn't die the death of a hero on a battlefield. Yes, Jesus endured great pain and suffering on, on the cross, but let's, let us never forget that he was also willing to submit himself to the shame and the disgrace of the cross. Let's all bow now as we pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity we have to gather together in this way and to partake of your supper, the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. And we're thankful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins. Father, we recognize the great pain and the suffering that he endured on the cross. But Father, we help us also recognize the great shame and disgrace that he was also willing to endure on our behalf. Father, now as we prepare to partake of the bread, Father, help us to realize that it represents the body that Jesus gave on the cross, freely gave on the cross for each of us, for the sins that we all possess, so that we can stand righteous and sanctified in your sight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, in the same manner, we come before you asking your blessings on this fruit of the vine that we all partake of now. Father, we recognize that this juice represents the blood that Jesus shed upon the cross, the blood that washes our sins away. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for the gift that you gave us through Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for each of us. And Father, we pray that you would bless us as we partake of this now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In James chapter 1, verse 17, we read these words. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is good. God is good all the time, and God is good to each of us. Even in times of distress, even in times of uncertainty, God is still blessing us. Each, day, each uh, Sunday morning, we are commanded to give of our means, and I know many of you have already made uh, arrangements for that by bringing your contribution.
by the building or putting it in the mail, and we thank you for that. But now let us take for just a moment and go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and reflect on God's great blessings for us. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day that you've given us. We're thankful for the refreshing rain that we've already been blessed with. Father, we realize that these are good things that you give us, good blessings. And Father, we realize that every blessing we have comes directly from your good and generous and loving hands. Father, please bless us now as we reflect on your great goodness for us. Please bless us as we make contribution to the church and to your work here in Double Springs. Father, we're so thankful for you and we pray that you would bless us as we go on through this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. this morning and tuning in to our services and worshiping with us and studying God's word. Appreciate Randy's beautiful prayer. I always enjoy, I know the Lord enjoys and we're talking to the Lord, but I always look forward to when he leads us in public prayer and he does such a wonderful job. Uh, at the conclusion of our time together, Brother James Allen Pruitt will lead us in a closing prayer and we just hope today's service is an encouragement to you as we worship the Lord together. Uh, before we get into this morning's uh, lesson, uh, this evening, if you have an opportunity before the 6 p.m. service to read Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we're walking through the letter to the uh, Philippians, and we uh, I will notice some things there. I feel that Philippians is a, a very timely letter for the things that we're going through. Of course, the Bible is always timely. But, you know, the uncertainty, uh, there's a, a letter that's filled with joy and filled with a focus on Christ. And we're going to talk about a Christ-centered life this evening. So if you have an opportunity uh, before 6 p.m. to uh, read through Philippians chapter 1. 
If you have your Bibles this morning, you'll be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be in verses 9 and 10 as we think about a life that is without regret. Have you ever regretted a decision in your life? Well, that's almost a silly question because anybody that's lived, uh, even children, they'll make a decision and you can see when they've made a bad decision, uh, you can see it on their face when they regret something or maybe they've made a decision uh, when they've gotten in trouble with their parents and you can see it on their face when they realize judgment is coming from mom and dad, uh, there is regret. It may be over a financial decision. Uh, Salesmen when they sell big ticket items, whether it be a house or, or a vehicle, part of their training is to remind the person who's buying the object that in two days you're going to regret buying uh, this particular object. And that feeling is normal. Have you ever had buyer's remorse? You wake up and you got that it's a feeling in the pit of your stomach and you think, oh, I should not have spent that money. Or you may have bought a vehicle and it turned out to be a lemon. I remember a a church bus uh, that we bought in the congregation that I grew up with. We were so excited about that church bus. It was a 30-passenger bus, one of the uh, first congregations in in the area here to have one. And I think in 10 years, they put 12,000 miles on that bus. And, and, And now, if you talk about the blue bus when you walk in the Winfield Church building, you can see people shake their heads because there was some buyer's remorse there, some regret. What about relationships? Have you ever said or done something in a relationship that ended that relationship? There may have been some measure of reconciliation, but something you said, something you did, uh, and that relationship was never the same. And when you see that person, it brings up that pain of, You know, I said something or I did something that greatly affected that person and in some cases may have affected that person's eternity because of something said or done that fills us with regret. What about when we should have done something but chose not to do it? And you think about going back through life and and you reflect upon decisions that are made and you thought, I should have said something to that person to encourage them, or maybe a loved one has passed away, and you say, I wish I could say one more thing to them, or say something that I should have said or done for that person uh, that I didn't do. You know, and I hope these decisions, uh, when we walk through them in life, uh, they teach us some things, they give us some wisdom to, to not repeat those things, Uh, But as we think about Christianity, Christianity is a life that is without regret. If you look up the word regret in the Bible, you'll actually see it occur with God and with people. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 and 6, the latest version of the English Standard Version of the Bible actually says, And the Lord regretted that he made man upon the earth. Um, We know there from that context that the decisions of mankind were evil continually. And as he looked at humanity, his creation, and seeing the decisions that they were making, it filled him with regret. It's also used in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, Saul is king and he's made some decisions to disobey the Lord. And there are three times in that chapter that it refers to the Lord regretting appointing Saul as king in verse 11, verse 29, and also verse 35. But there's also a time when it's used in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, I want you to notice a verse with me. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 21, and we look at the King Jehoram. Our Sunday morning class, we've been walking through First and Second Kings, and we've learned about some of these kings we may not have otherwise studied about. If you look at the reign of Jehoram, he was married to Ahab's daughter. He was a king of Judah. And if you read through this chapter here in Second Chronicles chapter 21, uh, you learn of a lot of mistakes that he made, and, and he caused uh, the people of Judah uh, to much grief. And and notice what it says at his death, verse 18, it says, And after all this, the Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. 
in the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. And notice this part here. And people made no fire in his honor like the fires that are made for the fathers. And he was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem. And he departed with no one's regret. What a statement to be made about you in death that when he passed away, people were relieved that he was gone because of the hardship that he created for people there in Judah. And so as we think about this idea of regret in in light of Christianity, our take-home point is going to be this before we get into our text is this. Godly living leads to a life with no regrets. With that in mind, let's go to the text in which we're going to focus on in the introduction here to, to, to look at living without regret here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul in defense of his ministry. Uh, he and the Corinthians had at least four letters passed between them. Um, two of them we don't have, two of them we have here in the Bible. And one of those letters was taken by a man named Titus. And this letter apparently had some correction. And Titus was going to have to to deal with some problems with the church there in Corinth. And Paul was anxiously waiting a word from Titus. How did they receive that letter? Paul loved that church. And in Acts, he spent 18 months with this congregation. And as he's awaiting this news, he, he gets it back and In chapter 2, he learns uh, that there is a relationship that had been, Paul thought, at least in his mind, had been severed because of some sin, and there was reconciliation there between he and that individual. And as the letter progresses, he comes back to it here in chapter 7. And I want you to notice how they received this letter. Begin reading with me here um, in verse 9. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There are examples in scripture where people committed sin and when confronted about that sin it brought us grief and I think about David when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan it brought him to grief and he penned Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 in in response to that particular situation you see that grief that sin brought brought about a change of life I think about Peter And Peter, after that third denial, he heard the rooster crow, and it brought about sorrow. The Bible says he ran away and he wept uh, because the Lord turned and looked at him as he made that third denial. Luke tells us that in Luke chapter 23. And we see over the course of time, John 21, and into Luke's historical account of Acts, that it motivated him to repent. He he changed his life as a result of those decisions. But we also see an example in Scripture where an individual was confronted with sin, brought him to grief, and the grief destroyed him. And think about Judas. When when Judas was confronted about that choice, and he he realized, I have made the wrong decision, and he threw that money back at the the Jewish leaders, the Bible says he went out and he hanged himself. You see, worldly grief, grief without godly decision produces destruction. It produces death. But when we choose to make godly decisions and making the right decision, it produces no regrets. Godly living always, godly choices always lead to a life with no regrets. So I want to look at some choices that we can make as Christians that every time we make these decisions, we will never have regrets. And these choices will bless our lives. They will allow us to be a godly influence in the world around us. They will allow us to lead our families to heaven. Uh, and we will live a life that is blessed. 
The first thing we notice in our time together is this, is that you will never regret living by faith. Let's stay here in Paul's letter to the Corinthians and go to chapter 5 and, and look at verse 5, and, excuse me, verse 7 and also verse 9. Here Paul has been talking about the tension between living and going to heaven and staying behind. And he says when we stay behind in verse 7, he says we walk by faith and not by sight. Contrary to popular opinion about this passage, Paul is not encouraging us to take a, quote, leap of faith or a leap in the dark. As a matter of fact, walking by faith is just the opposite of taking a leap into the unknown. A, a choice to walk by faith is a conscious decision to live in a way that pleases God. Look at verse 9 in this same context uh, as Paul is explaining this, this blessing and choice to walk by faith. He says, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So when you read verse 7, you've got to read it in verse 9, light of verse 9, because verse 9 really brings the discussion to a close. Verse 10, he says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so for us, walking by sight alone has a lot of perils. What, what are some of the perils? If we choose to do the opposite, and walk by sight and not by faith. Well, the first thing is this. If you choose to walk by sight and not by faith, you've got to rely on human judgment alone. It is comforting to know that we are, can, can live uh, in light of the scriptures. Or the, the scriptures is, is, are the foundation of our faith. And so you think about having to make judgment by yourself using your own faculties all the time. And think about how many mistakes that you will make, how much heartache you will have. So walking by sight alone requires us to, to walk by human judgment. A second thing, we're easily distracted by the issues of life. I think about the example of Peter in Matthew chapter 14. He had great faith, faith enough to defy all the laws of physics, to step out of that boat and walk on water. And as he's walking on water, he, he notices the things around him. He notices the wind and the waves. And he becomes distracted and begins to sink. And he cries out to Jesus. And Jesus responds to that and says, Oh, you of little faith. You see, when we choose to walk by sight, you know, Peter stepped out in faith, walking in faith, but then that quickly shifted to sight. And when we quickly shift to sight, well, we get distracted by all the things in our life. It may be the, some difficulties that we're going through. It may be pleasures that, that we don't want to give up uh, because those things are drawing us away from the Lord. And so for us, the challenge is to walk by faith and not by sight, a decision that will be without regret. So what are some of the blessings of walking by faith and not by sight? Well, the first blessing. You will have firm footing for the sojourn of life. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9. We, we know verse 8. That, that's the passage that describes Satan as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, how do we stay aware and, and vigilant, as the text says there in verse 8, uh, to keep from falling prey to this roaring lion? Look at verse 9 of this chapter. Resist him firm in your faith. The idea of firm in your faith the, behind the word firm is standing firm, firm footing. Uh, when it comes to defeating Satan and, and walking through this world and, and dealing with the temptations that we're dealing with, we need firm footing. We need to be firm in our faith so that we can withstand the devil. A few years ago, last to leaders there, a theme was 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, which was stand firm. Firm. You know, I don't like slippery places. I don't like stepping on something and feeling out of control. About two weeks ago, Blake and my brother and I were uh, doing some hunting, and we were walking through the creek bottoms on our family's property. And the creek was up just a little bit, 
And I thought, we can get across this creek. So I actually we didn't cross where we usually cross. I looked up and it was a little bit shallower. So I said, let's go up there and let's cross. The water was a, quite a bit swifter there. But I said, you know, we can, we can cross right there. What I couldn't see was a layer of green moss on, on those rocks in the bottom of that creek. Well, I made sure my brother got across. I made sure Blake got across. And as soon as I stepped in the middle of that creek, the next thing I felt was a rock bottom. And I thought to myself, as I slid, actually slid down the hill a little piece into a little pool, I stood, the first thing I thought is, well, I can't go to the hospital. We've got the COVID thing. I hope I'm okay. And as I gathered myself and stood up, uh, I hoped that my brother and my son would be concerned about my well-being. They were laughing, of course, as I probably would at them. Uh, I, I, was, I was fine, but, but when you, in a split second, are in a slippery place, that's, that can be very scary because all of a sudden you're, you're not in control. In Psalm 73, it, it compares those who walk by sight and walk by faith, and, and the psalmist is struggling with that. He says, I, he says, I look at people, and they're living ungodly lives, and they're blessed. It seems as if they have no problems. In the middle of that passage, beginning about verse 16, he says, I went to the house of the Lord, and I began to understand the end of their way. In that passage, he says, you, because of their choices, have set them in slippery places. Choosing to walk by sight is choosing to walk in slippery places because you don't have the firm footing of faith for the sojourn of this life. And so when it comes to us today, we need to make sure that we're walking by faith and not by sight. A, a, a second thing here, as we consider this walking by faith and not by sight, walking by faith leads to a life of obedience to God. One of my favorite hymns, it has been all of my life. I, I can remember first singing it at the Bankston Church of Christ when my granddad preached for about 30, 35 years. Small congregation of about 20 people and hearing those words, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. Don't you love those words when we sing those together as a congregation? Looking forward to the time when we can be back together. And we, we sung those just a few weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but when it comes to trust and obey, that's, a, that's walking by faith and not by sight. Well, what does that look like? Let's, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible gives us example after example of people who walk by faith and not by sight in this chapter. And you'll notice how it's prefaced by faith. On Wednesday, we noticed the example of Sarah, how she walked by faith. And I want you to notice, what does this look like? Well, and notice the verbs that are associated with walking by faith and living a life of obedience. Look at verse 4. Faith worships. By faith, Abel offered to God a sacrifice. Faith walks with God. Look at verse 5 in the example of Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. In Genesis chapter 5, we learn that he walked with God and he was not found. Faith draws near to God. Look at verse 6. It's not an example, but in the midst of these first examples, there is an exhortation. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith leads your family, verse 7, in the example of Noah, saving of his household. Faith focuses on the promises of God. Abraham's example begins in verse 8, and the, and the example of his family goes all the way through verse 32, or excuse me, verse 22. And there, each person that's mentioned, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they focused on the promises of God. Faith seeks holiness instead of pleasure. Look what's said about Moses in verse 23. By faith, Moses, and if you continue on through verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater than the treasuries of Egypt, for he was looking forward to that reward. And so walking by faith 
leads to a life of obedience to God and commendation. Verse 13 says, and these all uh, died in faith. A third thing, walking by faith and not by sight leads to a healthy lifestyle. Each of us would like to live a healthy lifestyle. And if we're honest with ourselves, to, to make healthier decisions than we did previously. You think about when you're on a diet. Well, the first thing you want is the things you're not supposed to have. Um, and so when it comes for us, living a healthy lifestyle, it seems that our culture is obsessed with that. Well, walking by faith and not by sight, it, not just necessarily physical health, but spiritual health. Now, turn to Titus uh, chapter 2. I want you to begin with me here in verse 1. I want you to notice some things. Uh, said about Titus, from Titus. He said, obey the things that deal with, quote, sound doctrine. And when it comes to sound doctrine, the word sound there deals with healthy things, those things that are healthy for us spiritually. And right doctrine leads to right living. And choosing to walk by faith and not by sight is a decision you'll never regret. A second thing you'll never regret is this, learning to tame the tongue Words. Words are powerful. Whoever came up with a poem, sticks and stones shall break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Didn't know what they were talking about. The Bible speaks much about taming the tongue, especially Proverbs. In James chapter 1 and verse 26, when describing pure and undefiled religion, the first thing he mentions in verse 26 is this, taming the tongue. In chapter 3 of that uh, particular letter, he mentions how the tongue even though a small part of our body can control the whole course of life. He compares it to a bit in a horse's mouth and a a rudder on a ship. And you think about when words have filled us with regret. And no matter what that may be, whether it be not saying something when you should have said something or saying something and, and it hurting someone or compromising your Christian example, you think about taming the tongue and, and, and learning to tame the tongue is something that if we do it, not only will it bless our lives, the first thing we'll notice, it blesses the life of others. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10 and notice verses 1 and 2. In Proverbs 10, 1 and 2, notice what he says about the value of, of, of a tongue. It says, A wise son makes a glad father, a foolish son is sorrow to his mother. Treasure is gain of profit, but... Uh, of righteousness delivers from death. And from this is going to start developing this theme and, and, and developing this theme and talking about living for righteousness and developing from this theme, you'll see in chapters 12, verse 18, 15 and verse 2, what does it mean to live for righteousness? And I went through in my Bible and I highlighted the times uh, in green that, that righteousness and the tongue are connected in this particular section in Proverbs and it was well over 10 times mentioned in this section that the controlling one's tongue and controlling one's speech lives for righteousness. Uh, if, if you look at chapter 15 in verse 2, it says this, The tongue of the wise commands knowledge, but the f- mouth of fools pours out folly. And, and so if you go back to chapter 12 and look at verse 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts and the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so when it comes to our life, the tongue can bless, but it can also hurt. Also, a tame tongue is a sign of a heart set on serving God. Remember when Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees in Matthew 15, and he starts talking about heart issues. They were offended because he, he quotes Isaiah, he says, your, your lips praise me, but your hearts are far from me. Um, and as he's talking to his disciples, he reminds them, he says, the things that go in the mouth, that's not what defiles a person. But the things that come out of a mouth, that's what defiles a person. In verse 18, he said, because the things that come out of your mouth... Well, that reveals what type of heart you have. You know, if we have a physical heart problem, we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort to deal with physical heart problems. 
If you go to the doctor and they say you've got high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or if an arteriogram or something the like is necessary, you, you want to get that done immediately and you're anxious until you get that done. Well, when you want to see symptoms of a bad spiritual heart, listen to what people say because it reveals the heart. A third thing, a tame tongue enables you to model godly behavior before others. You know, our speech can betray us and it can betray our faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, Set an example, Timothy. And he lists some areas of life. And one of those areas there is speech. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, We should bless our world with gracious words that season with salt. You know, salt in the ancient world was not only used as an additive for food, but it was used as a preservative. It was used to preserve and, and to maintain a certain standard of living and bless people's lives. A tamed tongue is something you'll never regret. A third thing you'll never regret is obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. The phrase obey the gospel is only found two times in the English Standard Bible. And in this particular version of the Bible, it is used to refer to people who don't obey the gospel. It's actually mentioned in times of warning. Let's, let's turn to First Thessalonians, or excuse me, Second Thessalonians, chapter one, and look at verses seven through nine. The Thessalonian church uh, was enduring um, some persecution, and uh, the first letter they were dealing with some issues regarding the second coming of Christ. And Paul follows up with a second letter, further explaining what does the second coming mean for a Christian. And in this case, he reminds them. He says, "People that are persecuting you." and that have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. Notice what it says beginning here in verse 7. And to grant relief to you and those who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the thing about regret and not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not just an earthly regret. It will be an eternal regret. And choosing not to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be like that rich man in Luke 16. You remember when he got to torment? That man was filled with regret. So much so that he begged uh, Abraham to send somebody to go preach to his brothers. He's one of the most evangelistic people in the Bible. was found in hell. And here this man is filled with eternal regret. And here in this text, one thing that we learn, if I choose not to obey the gospel of God, that won't be regret just for this life. That's regret for the life to come. Because you think about the blessings that are encompassed in regards to being a Christian. Having your sins forgiven. Sins blotted out, Acts 3.19. Washed away, Acts 22.16. Crucified, as Don talked about this morning, the, the power of the crucifixion. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Our eternal destiny is secure. 1 Peter chapter 1 and 3 says we have a, an inheritance that's undefiled, kept in heaven, reserved for you. Eternity is secure. You have access to blessings. God does not bless people equally. Even in people who aren't Christians, their blessings are not equal. That's especially true for a Christian because Christians have access, Ephesians 1, 3, to blessings that non-Christians don't have. The second time this phrase is found in the Bible is in 1 Peter 4, 17. And this is what he says. For it is time of judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome of those be who do not obey the gospel of God? What a sobering question. What is the outcome, eternal outcome, of those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? A fourth thing here. You will never regret laying aside the sin that clings to your life. If you go back to Hebrews, we looked at uh, chapter 11. Well, notice chapter 12. Those examples serve a purpose. 
And he, he uses the word therefore when you're studying your Bible and you see in the, in the King James Version, wherefore or therefore, you need to see what it's there for. It's bringing a, a point to a close here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Sin clings to our life and drags us down. It makes Christian living impossible. And trying to carry this burden is physically, mentally, and spiritually exhausting. And so for you, if, if you're dealing with sin and you're holding on to sin, I guarantee you this morning, if you choose to lay that sin aside and confess that sin and God is faithful and just to forgive us, that we and you will never live with regret. And because when it comes to laying aside that sin, it keeps obstacles out of my life. It keeps evil influences out of my life. And, and every person struggles with sin. You say, I don't have that struggle. Yes, you do. 1 John 1, 8 says so. And as a result of that, he follows up in verse 9 with this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so living a life without regret. Godly living leads to a life with no regrets. And these are just a few of the, the issues of life that we deal with. If we make godly choices in these areas, we will have a life that's not filled with regret. In 1961, Ray Kroc bought the McDonald's franchise from the McDonald's brothers. He paid them $2.7 million, which is a lot of money now, but especially in 1961. That amount guaranteed that the McDonald's brothers received a, a total of $1 million after taxes. Well, as he grew the franchise, if you look at what McDonald's is worth now, this is what it's worth. Oh, well, let's back up to his death. When he died, Ray Kroc was worth approximately $600 million. If you Google what is McDonald's worth, I did this on Friday, McDonald's is worth $8 billion dollars in total sales and has a net worth of 130 billion dollars i wonder if that mcdonald's family who actually doesn't own mcdonald's i wonder if they have some regrets maybe not they may have taken that money i don't know what they did with that million dollars but you see what a man he made a decision and he could see the potential i'm sure there were mistakes made along the way when we can see opportunity for growth in our spiritual life and making godly decisions, when we live by faith, when we tame the tongue, when we choose to obey the gospel and confess our sins to God, these decisions will lead to growth in a life without regret. Maybe you have some regrets, and there are ways of contacting us. We sing an invitation song just to kind of conclude the lesson to get you to think about the things we've studied together, we, we know there may be uh, things you need to confess. Con feel free to contact any of us. We are there to help you and pray for you and, and, and to do anything we can to help you draw closer to God. Now, maybe you'd like to obey the gospel. Uh, we can make that happen, social distancing and everything. And we've got the baptistry ready uh, for you if maybe you'd like to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and begin living life with no regrets. Um, as we sing one verse of an invitation song, think about these things, and if we can help you, be sure to let us know. Father in heaven, we continue our thanks for this day, <clears throat> for the blessings of this day, 
for the opportunity we have to serve you from the first day of the week, Father. We're thankful, Father, for this freedom. We're thankful for the country that we live in and the many freedoms that we enjoy, Father. We thank you for this blessing. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sins. We thank you for this church, Father. We pray for our elders. We ask you to bless them, Father. We pray for this congregation. We know we're not here physically, but we're praying and worship you at our homes. And we pray, Father, that our worship is acceptable to you. We thank you, Father, for this great opportunity. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our doctors, our nurses, who are fighting this virus. We pray the world over, Father, that you'll bless leaders of each nation, the doctors and the scientists, that they can help cure this dreadful disease, Father. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us throughout this day. Pray, Father, that you always guide us and that you always direct us and that you always forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.